Hello and welcome everybody to Dine with the Divine. I'm your host Ashley and we're going to go into the magical, the mystical and everything in between. On today's episode, we're going to talk about two very famous brothers. It'll be a good time. So, so today we have a great guest. We have Aaron here. So he's a creator of Storybook Sacred Lore of Witchcraft Podcast, exploring magical wisdom in fairy tales and classic literature. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're here. So how did you get into your fascination with fairy tales and and storytelling and literature? How did you get there? Growing up, I always loved to read. I always was fascinated and a fan of fairy tales, whether that was film and animated adaptions or reading them. And it was it was a bit of a guilty pleasure. It felt like something I should be putting away as I get older. But for some reason, they always stayed on my mind a little bit. And there were some ways I could navigate that. So there were literary analysis collections of fairy tales like Maria Tartar. There were psychological analysis such as Bruno Bettelheim and Jung or Marie-Louise von Franz. And so there were always ways that I could still read the fairy tales and pretend I was being adult and intellectual. (laughs) But I had a teacher when I was in my early 20s, and I was studying with a queer magical order called the Fellowship of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And I had a teacher who was also um, an initiate of traditional witchcraft. And he would say that in his lineage, their Bible was Grimm's fairy tales. And... And I'm cynical, but I was always intrigued too. And so I, I took it, I took that at face value and would ask him about it. And I'm sure he was only able to share so much of that, but it was something that always stayed with me. And especially because the fairy tales that we know were collected by Brothers Grimm changed a lot over the years while they worked on them. And mm-hmm. then since then, English translations have changed a lot over the years. And sometimes full meanings of the tales changed. And so that made me wonder too, like, how do you work with that as a sacred text? And I began exploring them on my own. That's so interesting. And I always wonder that too, about like, fairy tales, because you always hear, you hear tales, and you're like, okay, at the beginning of whenever people made this up, some of it has to have happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. all the stories you hear, we always hear. And then, of course, there, like you said, there's psychological analysis of it. I was listening to a podcast the other day and they do like, I think it's tales. I think it's just tales. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she, they always put like a little thing in the beginning and the end, usually like about the fairy tale. So either they'll do a little like where it comes from, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, they do a little bit of like of the meaning or like the psychological meaning of it or whatever. But they were talking about how like all the towers, a lot of the time, the towers were about like how they wanted to keep women chased and how mm-hmm. that was like the most important thing at the time. So it was like, mm-hmm. oh, her dad locked her up in a tower. It was like because it was so important for her to be a virgin or else the world was going to end or whatever. So like all these little things though in these tales were so interesting. I was listening to something else where they talk a lot about the whole, like about feminism in in a lot of the tales and how it's like, it's just really interesting. And depending on the culture or where you are in the world, the stories are even just like so different culturally. And they, they teach you so much about a culture, even though, if you want to say at face value, like, oh, this is a made up story. That's like the most basic thing you can say about a fairy tale. Um, but it gives you so much insight into the culture. Even like my favorite, I think my feet, I'm not going to say that. I am. My favorite anthology I think of like fairy tales is A Thousand and One Nights. I love A Thousand mm-hmm. and One Nights. I could read it over and over because it's just wild. Like it just keeps going and going. <laughs> Every story bleeds into another story and you have to pay attention because this story is so complicated. So complicated. (laughs) But it's so cool (laughs) how this one one story is about you'll have three stories and it's three stories being told by one a story before that about people being at a party telling the story. So you have to pay attention. (laughs) Yeah. And someone will ask, you know, someone will ask for information and they'll be like, it's like this story where blah, 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 but you're already two stories in deep. And you're like, oh shit, here we go again. 
It's so much. Even like all the stories from about Sinbad the Sailor are mm-hmm. just the stories he was telling at his own dinner party. Like he was having a dinner party and he's like, <laughs> you guys don't think I'm a badass? Hold on. Let me tell you another story. And that's every single story. <laughs> and then at the end, he gives some money to another guy because he's like, you should go on adventures too. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. The symbolism of the towers. And this isn't my personal story, but my husband grew up in a very rural area and Mm -hmm. it would have been before the 1950s. His, let's see, his father, someone who told him, how do I put this? Okay. His father basically kidnapped his mother. So she, she was a young girl at the time and the young girl's brother was like yeah give me some money i'll show you which windows is yours come with your truck at night and you could just pull her out through the window and and this man did and then it caused a big uproar and the and they had to bring her back the next day because the parents were upset and then he ended up proposing and marrying her anyway but that's something straight out of these women locked in the tower stories and it happens (laughs) and it's I'm glad everything worked out in this one. <laughs> it's horrible. I was like, <laughs> I know I clutched my pearls when he told me this story. <laughs> like, sir, what? <laughs> like everybody, everyone was not consenting in this situation. Okay. But everybody's okay now. Yeah. <laughs> There's like, I think it's in, I believe it's in Indonesia. It's symbolic, though. It's not like mm-hmm. a real kidnapping, but they do that. It's like a joke. Everybody's like in on the, the horse joke. comes and, yeah, the and wife, you pick the, her up. And yeah, the girl's in on it. And usually like the partner number one gets all his, all his or her friends. It's usually a man and a woman, but the guy gets all his friends and they're like, we're going to kidnap her. And everybody's like, oh, and the woman's like, oh. <laughs> Like everybody knows, and at the end, it's like, ah, oh, look at us being so stupid. <laughs> that actually sounds amazing, though. Yeah, it's- <laughs> like living out a romance novel fantasy. <laughs> I saw one like video of it. So this guy goes to get his fiance. <laughs> he's trying to carry her, but he's obviously getting very windy. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, "It's fine, just put me down." He's like, "No, I'll walk." <laughs> He's like, no, I'm going to carry you. And she's like, you seem tired. You're going to drop me. This is getting dangerous. Even she was laughing. She's like, let's just, the joke is up. Like, we all get it. It's fine. He's like, no, I got to take you to a specific field. And then we got to laugh. And then we got to go back. He's you like, know what? If he, if he can't do it, maybe that's the sign that, oh, that's not the right one. <laughs> we have to take another suitor. If she's been on him being a farmer, maybe not. He can't. He doesn't seem strong. <laughs> my man was huffing and puffing but like that's okay <laughs> they seemed okay. like they really enjoyed each other and she was she thought it was funny i'm like whatever you guys want to do it's a good time <laughs> oh gosh so now that we've talked about kidnapping people getting married <laughs> we're gonna go on to a really random other subject so we're gonna do our dish of the week every week we're gonna talk about a dish that relates to our story and today we're gonna talk about German rhubarb almond cake. This is a rhubarb custard cake that is very popular in Germany, apparently. If you are in Germany, let me know if this is true. The base of the cake is rich and buttery and it's topped with like chopped rhubarb. I don't like rhubarb, but I pretend that I do because everybody around me one time was eating rhubarb. They're like, it's so good. I was like, yeah. I didn't like it. Rhubarb is having a comeback. It never really went away, but it definitely seems to be gaining in popularity like the, <laughs> the, the past few summers. Absolutely. People are into it. Like, and that's cool. Maybe if somebody I don't cooks it right, I'll like it, but I don't know. But I do like almonds and I like things that are rich and buttery, so I might like this. So there's a lot going on in this German cake. And there's a couple layers. So the first is we have a short crust bake. So they knead it and they roll it into some pie dough because we know the Germans love some pie dough and they press it into a cake pan. Then you take sugary rhubarb pieces and you scatter those over the crust and then you put um, creamy almond flour custard um, with vanilla extract and cinnamon. Okay, that sounds good. The custard, the way you make the custard is vanilla vanilla sugar, which is just white sugar with vanilla. Okay, I was like, what's that? That's easy. And if you don't have 
Oh, this is white sugar infused with vanilla beans. Damn, who's buying yeah. vanilla beans? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, vanilla is already expensive. Extract. I'm sure the beans are a million dollars. That sounds expensive. Yeah, we're just going to use vanilla extract, everybody. Don't worry. Don't go to Whole Foods and look for vanilla beans. You'll be fine. Then we have cream franchise. I hope I say that. Right. And that's essential for the velvety texture of the decadent filling. And if you can't find that in the grocery store, you can just make your own franchise, which there's a link in the recipe to how to do that if you're interested. Or you can use sour cream or Greek yogurt. The thought in my head when people substitute things with sour cream it makes me uncomfortable because I think a sour cream is something I'm putting on a potato and not in a baked good. It, it seems so weird, but it really works in desserts. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I feel yeah. the same way about sweet potato pie, though. I can't eat it because I know it's a sweet potato. <laughs> it just makes me upset. <laughs> I really prefer my sweet potatoes like French fried. In me too. Honesty. Let's put yeah. let's put a little spicy paprika or something on them. Some yes. salt. Yes, I prefer a savory sweet potato. So I think that's why when I see sweet potato pie, I'm very uncomfortable and I can't even eat it. Like it tastes. If someone tells me, "Oh, it's pumpkin pie," I'll eat it. But You'll like, eat it. If, yeah, I'll be like, "Oh, I love pumpkin <laughs> pie." But if I find out it's sweet potato pie, I can't eat it. Right. I'll be like, "No, thank you. Thank you so much. That was nice, but no, thank you." Okay. So we talked about the filling. So you're going to make your cake, everybody. You're going to make the rhubarb filling. And you're going to put the sugar and the rhubarb filling in a a bowl. You're going to put it together. And then you're going to release some of the rhubarb juice. Take about an hour. Then you're going to make the cake. You're going to beat butter and sugar together in a large bowl until it's light and fluffy. Then you're going to add flour, wine, nice, baking powder, and eggs to form the dough. Then you're going to put that and wrap it up and put it in the refrigerator for 5 to 10 minutes. Then you're going to preheat the oven to 350 and grease a nine inch cake pan. Roll out the lightly floured circuit, blah, 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 the lightly floured surface <laughs> into a circle slightly larger than the diameter of the cake pan. Transfer to the prepared cake pan, let the, letting the dough come up on the sides of about an inch. Then you're going to drain the rhubarb. Then you're going to put it in the oven around the dough. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Then you're going to have your cake. Okay, and then you're gonna put almonds on top of it. It's gonna be delicious. Is there a picture? Does it look like a pie? It looks like this is my black and white tablet, so you probably can't see it. It does look like a pie. It looks beautiful, actually. Yeah, it's more like a cake, I think. But like, either way, whatever they want, it sounds nice. (laughs) It sounds really nice. I've never cooked with rhubarb. I've eaten it. I've never cooked with rhubarb, Mm -hmm. and I think one of the reasons is it's it seems to be one of those things you only cook with if you grow it. Yeah. So that's not true, but yeah. it totally seems to me like, oh, I have to have a rhubarb bush and back in order to make strawberry rhubarb pie. Exactly. That's how I think, too. It's one of those things. It's like people who eat. I always get I forget what it's called, but it's like a vegetable and it's purple on the end. And it's like a celery stick. Like a Swiss chard or yeah, a, chard. Um... Swiss chard. I'm like, the only people who eat Swiss chard are people who grow it. Like that's in my yeah. head and they love yeah. it. And I'm happy for them. Like, like, I've eaten it. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But everybody I know who eats it has grown it in their backyard. And I'm like, you know what? Whatever floats your boat. If you like it, great. I'm not a fan. But it's, it's okay. It's not about me. <laughs> People want to grow it. Everything is not about me. Um, okay. Now, we're going to go to our tea time. And as I have alluded to several times already, we're going to talk about two of the most famous brothers in the fairy tale game. You all know who these are. We're talking about the Brothers Grimm today because why not? Let's get to the let's get to the origin story, the basics of who these dudes are. We know they were walking around the Black Forest apparently asking people if they heard a story. We know that part. <laughs> mm-hmm. But where did they come from? Who are they? Who are these guys? Let me tell you, they came from the bottom to the top. They they did a good job. All right. So it starts like this. Jacob Ludwig Carl Grimm, he's the older brother. And then Wilhelm Carl Grimm. They're both Carls, but one's Carl with a K and one's Carl with a C. Whatever. Jacob and Wilhelm, that's all we need to really know. Born. So Jacob was born January 4th, 1785. And then Wilhelm was born February 24th, 1786. In Hanau in Land Gravite of Helsey Castle which was within, at the time, 
the Holy Roman Empire, but right now it would just be Germany. And they were born to Philip Wilhelm Grimm, who was a jurist who's like a lawyer, but not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I was like trying to understand what a jurist is. Like you, you work for the government, just know that. And you're like a lawyer, but not really all the laws. And Dorothea, his, their mom, Grimm, who was the daughter of a castle city councilman. So they weren't rich, but they definitely weren't middle class. They were in between that. They were doing mm -hmm. well. They were the second and third eldest surviving siblings of the nine children that the mom had. <clears throat> Three of them died within, in infancy. So in 1791, the family moved to the countryside town of Steinau. German people, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing the names of your towns. I'm doing my best. But I think it's Steinau. And this is because Philip, the papa, he became a district magistrate. Good job, right? So they moved and they became prominent members of the community. They were doing really good. And they lived in a really nice house surrounded by like, beautiful fields. All the kids, they were probably running around, hanging out. Maybe they were wearing lederhosen. I don't know. Do all German kids wear lederhosen all the time? Probably not. But maybe they were. <laughs> I like to think about it because it's cute. Like the little suspenders, this is adorable. But the, everybody was happy. Like things were going really well. They had private tutors. They got really good Lutheran education, hardcore religious Lutheran education because they were German children. So that's what happened. It's fine. Later on, they attended schools after they had some tutors early in their lives. So then in 1796, unfortunately, tragedy stock struck. Mr. Grimm, <clears throat> the dad, he died of pneumonia. So this caused a huge problem, obviously, because he was a district magistrate. He was the one making all the money. And Dorothea, the mom, she was forced to give up all of her stuff because she had no money. She didn't have a job. It's the late 1700s. She probably didn't have a career of any time. She was just married to a dude. That's how it worked back then. So she now had to go and rely on her father and her sister for financial support. Sorry, my page went away. Oh, so she had to rely on her and her sister was the first lady in waiting at the court of William the first, who was the elector of Hesse. So she had a good job. She was still a servant, but like a high ranking servant. So like she had a decent job, this sister. So they were help helping support her sister. So Jacob, because he was the oldest boy, he was only 11, but he was the oldest. Now he had to assume all the dad responsibilities, which sucks because he's 11. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. First of all, your dad dies. That sucks. And now yeah. you're the, the default dad. You're 11 years old. He shared those with Wilhelm. Him and his brother, obviously, the brothers Grimm, they got along pretty well. And they support each other, not to spoil the story, but for the rest of their lives, they're very close. So Wilhelm would help him do whatever they had to do. And then their grandfather was constantly trying to help them work or try to find them things to do to help the family, basically. So they left Steinhau and the whole family in 1798 to attend this, this school called Frederick's Gymnasium. Literally, that's the whole word is Frederick's Gymnasium. It's not no space. Castle. That's German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, is it, is it Frederick's? Gymnasium? Nope. Roger nope. Gymnasium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, cute. They attended this school, and this was arranged for and paid for by the aunt, the one who's the lady in waiting. But they don't have any male provider because also their grandfather died that same year. So this forced mm -hmm. them to rely on each other, and that's when they became super close because they had to rely on each other for everything at this point. And they knew... <clears throat> oh, they were also very different. So Jacob was very introspective and like he really just like wanted to chill by himself. He was probably like that kid that you knew who was always just like reading in the corner. Like he was cool. Like he didn't have any smoke with anybody. Like everybody liked that kid, but they're just like, ah, oh, don't bother him. He's quiet. That's <laughs> that was probably Jacob. But Wilhelm was way more like, hey guys, like let's like let's hang out. But Wilhelm was also very sickly. So this caused him some problems, but he was very outgoing. But both of them were really smart and really motivated. So that was really awesome. And they both motivated each other. And they also became very aware when they were at Frederick's Gymnasium that they were the poor kids there. Even mm -hmm. though they came from a high social status before, 
But now they didn't have any money, this, that, and the third. And they became aware that we're not really being treated the same way as these, quote unquote, like it says here, high-born kids are. We be, mm-hmm. We're not treated the same way. No matter what, though, they didn't give a shit about that. Because guess what? Jacob, he graduated head of his class in 1803. And then Wilhelm also graduated ahead of his class in 1804. Good job, boys. <laughs> Deserve a hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Wilhelm would have graduated earlier. But he missed a year because he has scarlet fever. Yikes. Scarlet fever sounds all of those old timey. Okay, I'm not going to go on my rant. I'm not going to put my nurse hat on and talk about vaccines because that's controversial. But get vaccinated. But why people are so like, I don't want to get vaccinated against the measles and the mumps. Do you want it? Because it sounds awful. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want a pock ridden face? (laughs) What I'm saying is like, do you want diphtheria? Like who? Do you know, do you, like, first of all, do you know that like, like the past, I think and maybe the past 15, 20 years when people started getting all upset about vaccines all the time, this is not funny at all. There was pediatricians who were like, you need to get vaccinated because us, we don't even know those diseases. So when your kid comes in with the measles or the mumps, we don't know what the fuck to do. Right. We had eliminated them theoretically for so long yes these pediatricians in their 30s are like we don't even know what the mumps are like we i've never literally there's people who were like i've never known anybody to have the mumps so if your kid comes in with the mumps i don't know we're just gonna throw some i don't know give them some Tylenol and pray for the best because at this point we don't know what to do about it (laughs) why ask them not to come in (laughs) (laughs) you guys gonna have to stay home and figure it out (laughs) We'll drop you off some ibuprofen and pray. That <laughs> way. <laughs> so that's crazy. Yeah, so everybody, don't get the mumps. Anyway, so after their graduation from Frederick's Gymnasium, the boys, then they went and attended the University of Marburg. So this is a small university. There's only like 200 students. And then they became even more aware how poor they were. It was mm-hmm. probably like going from their like community college or their high school. They like got into like, let's say like, Cornell or something and they're like damn everybody here has a lot of money and we do not and so much so that they both wanted to study law and they were obviously very intelligent um young guys but they didn't have the social standing which is so messed up (laughs) if that was a requirement nowadays (laughs) they're like "Mm, your family doesn't come from money so you can't study law they were like wait but isn't this about how smart we are they're like nope like, no, you have under 500 followers and. <laughs> That's basically what they said. <laughs> Your family wasn't popular enough and they don't come from old money and you guys don't have a yacht. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. But again, this is why I like the story, because these boys, they don't care. They just keep going. So they were like, fuck it. We'll study languages. It's, <laughs> yes, they're like, fuck you guys. Watch us become the most famous people forever. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> still bringing in them royalties. Hello? <laughs> I wish I was a gram because I'd still be making some money. I know. The wealthier students, they got stipend. But the brothers, they didn't even get a tuition aid, which, damn, I didn't even know they had tuition aid back then. Like I said, they filled out their FAFSA, but they didn't let them get anything. That's not nice. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. So they weren't able to also participate in student life and activities because they didn't have money and they had to work. So then their law professor, who I guess they tried to study law still, their law professor was like, look, let me tell, talk to you guys real quick. You're never going to make it in this game, especially because your, your parents are nobodies. Your papa has died. We're so sorry. But you want to study um, some history and maybe some books? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So they started studying Medieval German literature. So their professor, Frederick von Savigny, Savigny, Savigny. We're just going to say that for now. He was like, start studying German literature because we are super into uniting Germany. So this is like the time, again, like I said at the beginning, Germany was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't Germany. There was just like a bunch of different principalities and they were Germanic places yeah at this point they said there's 200 of them and Savigny was like we need to like rally and get all these people together so we can have a whole Germany 
So finding out, obviously, in any place around the world, what brings people together, your national stories, your national poems, your thinking about all these different places in the world. Like India, they had the Mahabharata, which is the national epic of India, which is awesome. So it brought them all together to be like, yeah, this is our story, raw. Cool. So Savigny had a bunch of friends who were also writers and poets, German romantics such as Clemens Brutano and Ludwig Achmann von Arnim. And they were introduced to all these guys, the Grimm's. And they were also introduced to the ideas of Johann Gottfried Herder, who thought that German literature should revert to simpler forms, which he did. I'm not going to read that part because I can't pronounce it. But basically, like people, I think this is my theory. People try to be more like high up by making things more complicated. But this guy was like, no, why don't we just make things basic? And I think this made sense for the Grimm brothers. And that's why they're further works go into them going and just literally asking people hey what are your folk stories because he's like this is what we should go with here we don't have to do all these high born stuff and make everything artistic and this and that let's let's just ask basically like what the hell happened now after they learned all this the brothers Grimm they decided to dedicate themselves to studying all these kinds of stories William actually wrote Wilhelm wrote in his autobiography, the ardor with which we studied old German helped us overcome the spiritual depression of those days. So they just like really loved it and it made them really happy, which Mm. makes me happy. So Jacob, he was still the, the dad of the family, the patriarch of the family at this point. So he was still financially responsible for his mom, his brother and his younger siblings. So in 1805, he accepted a post in Paris as Savigny's um, research assistant. On his return to Marburg, he was forced to abandon his studies to support his family. And their poverty had gotten so bad that they were saying that once a day, there were five people and they could only eat once a day because like they had nothing. Yeah, they were really poor at this point. Um, So then Jacob then found full time employment in 1808 when he was appointed as a court librarian to the king of Westphalia. And went on to become the librarian in Castle. So this is like a really good position. Mm -hmm. This isn't like maybe it's like your local library, but it's like a big deal local library. It's not your library where you go to use a computer and print things out for free because you're not a printer like me. Then their mom died. And then Jacob became fully responsible for his younger siblings. At this point, he had a job, which was good. So he started figuring out what he's going to do with everybody. He arranged and paid for his brother Ludwig's studies at art school. That's pretty cool of him. And then for Wilhelm, he extended his visit to Hall to seek treatment because Wilhelm, like I said, he was very sickly. He had respiratory problems, heart problems. So he was in this place called Hall getting treatment. But then after he got a little bit better, he went and joined Jacob at Castle and became a librarian. And then his friend Brutano, he requested that the brothers start going around and collecting folk tales. And this is in 1807. And Mm -hmm. they didn't have a ton of money to do this, but they were like, we're going to do it. So this says, according to ZP, who I think wrote a book about these guys, he said the Grimm's were unable to, to devote all their energies to their research and did not have a clear idea about the significance of collecting folk tales in this initial phase. Yeah, I read that a couple of times. They were like, okay. (laughs) They're like we'll go talk to people and collect stories but like we don't really know why we're doing this but like fine so they did <clears throat> so during their employment as librarians which gave them a lot of time for research they didn't have a ton of money but they gave they had a lot of time for research obviously if you're a librarian they may they wrote a lot they published a whole bunch of books so this is between 1812 and 1830 in 1812 they published their first volume of 86 folk tales called him Kinder und Hausmarchen, which was followed by two volumes of German legends and a volume of early liter- literary history. Mm-hmm. And then they went on to publish works about Danish history, Irish folk tales, also North mythology. And they were still editing all their German folk tales too. And then people like all over the country... And the land, we're starting to hear about this. So this became so popular that they actually received honorary doctorate degrees from the universities in Marburg, 
Berlin and Breslau, which was like pretty cool. Wow, go Brothers Grimm. I know, for two boys who were told they couldn't be lawyers because they didn't have enough money, they got honorary doctor degrees. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm so proud of them. So then in May 15th, 1825, Wilhelm, he decided to go and get married. He married a lady named Henriette. Oh, Henriette. So cute. I like that name. Her name's Henriette Dorothea Dorchen Wilde. Okay, Henriette Wilde. Love it. She she was also, also a source of many of the tales that they collected. Yes. And I've mentioned briefly in, in one of my discussions on my podcast, I was like, could you imagine the like the casting the love spell of just the mundane action of Scheherazade come back tomorrow and I'll tell you the next story and over this time their courtship develops because they keep visiting her to hear these tales yes and that's exactly what I thought too I thought of Scheherazade and I was like oh my god that's so cute I know she's probably telling him and he's probably walking away like oh she's so cute and he's she's like I got him (laughs) I got my sexy librarian (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> like Henriette, I saw that game and I love it. So she was a pharmacist's daughter and she's actually a childhood friend. And again, here we go, who gave the brothers a lot of the tales. Jacob, he never married, but he stayed with them. Like he lived with them for like I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that cute? He was too busy. He had all these all these mouths to feed. I know. I was like, oh Jacob. But I just love how Wilhelm and Jacob were just in it to the end. They were yeah. so adorable as brothers. They were the original property bros. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really were. Like, they loved each other so much. And like, they really came up together. And like, and they have other siblings that like are there but are not property bros. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, whatever. Like when their other siblings like, would call or write, they'd have to ask about the other one because they can't just write yeah. to one. <laughs> yeah. Or they just write to both of them together because they yeah, know just write to them together. Like yeah, <laughs> they know they're gonna read it to each other, so they're like, "We'll just write to Wilhelm and Jacob. We can't ask either one." Some drama in 1830. Both the brothers were overlooked when they tried to apply for the chief librarian. At where, where are we at now? Oh, in a different town. I don't know which one now. You guys, sorry, I got confused. Right. I'm right now. Yeah. So they moved because they were like, we got to get out of here. We got to get a better job. So they moved, the, all three of them, they moved to Got- Gottingen? Gottingen in the kingdom of Hanover, where they took employment at the University of Gottingen. Gottingen. And Jacob became a professor and the head librarian, and Wilhelm was also a professor. A professor, they just had honorary doctorates. Good for them. For the next seven years, they continued to research and write. And then 1835, Jacob per, uh, published German mythology. Wilhelm cont- uh, continued to edit and prepare the third edition of Kinder und Hausenmarchen for publication. And they taught German studies at the university and they became extremely well respected throughout all these different schools. Now, once again, drama. In 1837, they both lost their jobs because they joined this protest. That's not right. They were protesting for their rights, basically. So what had happened was there was this group called, in the 1830s, there was this group called the Young Germany. And they were like the peasant class. And they decided to 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 revolt. So they were not like directly involved with the Young Germans, but they, they supported them. And there was some drama with this guy named Ernest Augustus, who was a king of Hanover in 1837. And he dissolved the parliament of Hanover and just told everybody like, oh, I'm just going to be king now. And everyone's like, hold on, we didn't ask for that. So they were protesting against that, rightly so. They're like, that shit's crazy. And because they decided they were like, we're not going to allege oath to this guy because he did something terrible, we think. They got deported. But I guess, like, there's 200 different German principalities, so it's fine. Like, you can just go to another one, I guess. <laughs> seven of the professors were, seven of the professors of from the University of Gottingen were dismissed. And some of them were Jacob and Wilhelm. They all left, and they got deported, and they went back to Castle. So then the brothers, they had no job, again. And they were like, oh, what do we do now? It's 1838. Nobody has any money. And what they decide to do is they're just going to write a German dictionary. So they started this German dictionary. They don't finish it. and They don't publish it. I'm sorry. Until 1854. So this is like 16 years later. They actually published their book. 
they depended on friends and family for financial support and finding different ways to make it. Then Savigny, that guy, their old professor who convinced them to do any of this in the, in the first place, and Benetta von Arnim appealed to success, appealed to Frederick William IV of Prussia. So he's the king of mm-hmm. some area, guys, of Prussia. I know Prussia gets very confusing. We'll talk about it later. So in addition to teaching, they got money for their research now. They established and they just all went to Berlin and started living there. Jacob started researching German legal traditions and the history of the German language. And he published another book about it in eighteen in the 1840s. And then Wilhelm began researching medieval literature. And he's still editing Hossenmarch. And he's been editing that for 30 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it ended up being like, uh, yeah, 40 years of different editions. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. my God, man. Like, <laughs> but time for that. Time for the bar scene in Berlin. <laughs> I'm like, they, I know. I'm like, I don't, Berlin. I'm like, think of like 1930s Berlin. I don't know what Berlin was like then, but Berlin was <laughs> right. freaking cool. <laughs> Berlin was so cool. I watched, I read this whole thing. I was watching something. I was, no, this is a podcast. We were talking about Berlin in the 1930s and how, like, so crazy the next thing that yeah. happened in the late 1930s. But, like, in the beginning, everybody yeah. was, like, doing drugs. The LGBTQ scene was cool. Like, everybody was, like, cool. Totally. Like, it was totally. fun. Like, everybody was down. Everyone was doing drugs. Everyone was chilling. Everyone's making amazing art. It was fun. Like, it just had a really good time. All the clubs were hopping. People were having a good time. Like, <laughs> literally, I'm like, oh, my God, Berlin sounded like the tits back then. Okay, so now, after the revolutions in 1848, so there were some German revolutions. In the German states, the brothers, they elected to be part of the civil parliament. So Jacob became a prominent member of the National Assembly at Mainz. But they weren't. They were political for long, and they thought Germany would get together, but then it didn't. And they were just like, oh, we, we were tired of trying to fight for this. They're getting older. They're exhausted. Jacob, he resigned in the, na- in the late 1940s and published the history of the German language. Wilhelm, he continued at the university until 1852, and then he retired from teaching, and the brothers both devoted themselves to the German dictionary for the rest of their lives. Wilhelm died of an infection in Berlin in 1859. And Jacob, who was super, obviously, this is his best buddy for his whole entire life. So he became incredibly depressed. He became incredibly depressed and increasingly reclusive. So he just stayed to Mm. himself after that. He continued to work on the dictionary until he died in September 20th in 1863. And Zeppi is that guy who wrote about them. He said that the last word of their book that they wrote was Prust, which means fruit. Okay. Hmm. That's the Brothers Grimm story, guys. Dictionary, if I understand correctly, their dictionary is actually the first real dictionary. So they invented what we know as the modern dictionary. And like Miriam Webster were inspired by this new project that was going on in Germany to then make an English language d- dictionary. That's awesome. Yeah. What a task to literally make a dictionary. What an exhausting task. Yeah. And really not that long ago, if mm-hmm. you think about it, like if it came out in the 1850s, that's really not that long ago for something that I take for granted. 100%. And now that you said that, it really makes me think about that too. Wow, that's like- not even like 200 years ago, they were like, let's write down all our words. You would think people would have written them down before. Mm-hmm. But they were like, we, nah. we know them. We say them. We don't yeah. need to write them down. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that. And it makes you think there's a lot of cultures who have oral traditions and they don't have dictionaries. And it's right. sad because we don't know anymore the dead languages or people are no longer there. But that is really cool. I'm really proud of them. I really like them. When I was reading about their life, I was like, I really like these guys. They seem cool. They seem like a good guy. They seem cool. And they're open to, they were raised in what I would probably call like a very 
strict or hard German Protestant upbringing. They would have been taught, they would have been taught a Lutheran form of Protestantism, I think. But they were so open to the mystical and pagan beliefs of the past that they were hope that they were hoping to recapture in those stories. I love that. I love it. It's so interesting. And I love how they literally this this project, a part of it started for them to be like, let's get all the Germans together. <laughs> let's do that <laughs> about our national stories and all our stuff. In between, we had Wilhelm falling in love with the girl next door when she knew a whole bunch of stories. Like, it's just, the whole thing is very neat. I love it. So, we've come to our story time where we're going to tell one of their stories. This story today obviously comes out of their book, I have, Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. And today's story is called Maid Meline. Maid Meline was a story I liked. I like a lot of these stories. There was a different story I read, and I was like, this story, some of these stories are nonsense. <laughs> and I love it. I love totally. it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Totally. I, the more nonsensical a story is, the more I love it. This is the same way I feel about every time I learn about the mythology of like, some ancient deity and their story is just wild. I'm like, I love it. Because it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't need to. It's none of my business. This is a story, and I need to shut up about it. But <laughs> love it. <clears throat> Now, here's the story of me, Maline. So, here's the deal. There was this king, and he had a son. And the, he went, the son went to his dad, and he's like, Dad, there's this girl. Her name's Maline, and she's a hottie, and I think I'm in love with her. And the dad's like, okay, cool. So, he calls the other king. He's like, hey, my son is really, like, into your daughter. And the king's like, I don't care about that, because I already told her she's got to marry somebody else. Me, Maline, meanwhile... The other king, he doesn't know that his daughter, Maline, is in love with this guy. So he doesn't even know they know each other. So her dad was like, Maline, funny story. I got a phone call today from that other king over there. And he said that his son wants to marry you, but I told him absolutely not. And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, because you have to marry this other dude I got for you. And she's like, absolutely not. I'm not marrying some other dude. Um, so she gets mad and she's like, dad, try me today. And the dad's like, try me. I'm going to build a tower and put you in it. <laughs> so he did. So just speaking of towers, um, he put her in his tower and he said, you're going to stay up there for seven years until you get your shit together and you learn how to talk to me. Oh my God. So he, put, at least he said, let me put her up there with a lady in waiting, which why you just, well, I guess so she didn't go crazy. She has somewhere to talk to put her up there in this tower with her maid so they're up there for seven years and for seven years they got seven years of worth of food apparently they calculated this very well and they put it up there now time's going by time's going by time's going by also the king's son he heard about this and he knew Malin was in the tower so he went over there on his horse i'm assuming <laughs> he went over there and he'd be like Malin, Malin, like he was yelling And he wouldn't hear anything. And there was no way for him to get up there. There was no way for him to get in. She was locked in. So now time is going by. Time is going by. Time is going by. Malene realizes that it's almost been seven years. And their food is running out. So she's like, I guess someone's coming to get us. Because he sent seven years. And it's been almost that time. And the lady in waiting is like, yeah, I guess so. Because this is out of control. But now it's like the last days of the seven years. And they're realizing, like, we literally have no food left. Like, someone needs to come. But they were waiting to hear noise, to hear horses, to hear people. They didn't hear anything. A couple days went by. Now their food is, like, out. So they're like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So Malene was like, we got to do, get whatever utensils we got. And we're going to try to dig ourselves out of this thing. So they just chipping away at the wall. Finally, after, like, three days of continuously chipping away at the wall, they see like a little like dime size hole. So they're like, okay, we're doing it. We're doing it. They get crazier. They keep going. They keep going. They keep going. Finally, they get enough space that they can both crawl out of the uh, tower. Now they're looking around and the sky is blue. And they're like, oh my God, thank God we're out of this stupid ass tower. This is crazy. But they go to the kingdom, like to the castles burned down. The villages around it are burned down. There's nobody... They can't see anybody. Everybody's gone. And they're like, that's why nobody came to get us because everybody is gone. 
Um, it looks like the town has been ravaged by some type of war or fire. So they're like, what the hell are we going to do? Now we have nobody to talk to. We don't know anybody anymore. So the two of them, they start going, they're just walking around. They're two homeless women now who have nothing. So they're walking, they go from house to house. They're begging, they get a bread here, a little bread there, a little water here. Finally, they get to this neighboring kingdom and they get seen by like some maids and they were like, oh my God, you guys, we're starving. Is there any way you could give us some food or even give us a job? And both of them, they're like, okay, we can give you a job. You guys can come in here and you can be scullery maids. And they're like, fine, no problem. Like just, we just need food and water. So they go into the place um, and they see that they're like, actually, we need a lot of help this week. We were actually going to call in reinforcements because the king's son is getting married. And they were like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, the king's son's getting married this week. The, the food needs to be cooked. The feast needs to be made. And they're like, okay, cool. So then they were like, actually, Maline, you look like a good uh, lady in waiting. So we're going to have you tend to the bride. And she's like, okay, cool. No problem. So she went in here and the story says, let me read it for him. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you, this is very important. The kingdom that they're at is actually the kingdom of the man that Malin wanted to marry. Duh. Mm -hmm. Well, I should have been keep part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so she, Malin's like, oh shit, but it's fine. She's just, she's going to go along with whatever they tell her to do. She's, she's not the woman she used to be, she feels. She's been through a lot of trauma. It's fine. So here it says, um, his father had chosen another bride for him whose face was as ugly as her heart was wicked. <laughs> <laughs> In Grimm's gonna... Fairy Tales, <laughs> ugliness talks about the internal nature, usually. <laughs> I was like, ooh, they said that a face only a mother can love. <gasps> that is so rude. They said she was ugly. So basically, she was a nasty woman. She wasn't very nice, okay? She was mean. Mm -hmm probably cold-hearted person she was not kind okay fine that's what we got anyway it doesn't matter so the wedding was already set meanwhile the prince didn't even know what she looked like so it didn't matter because his dad was like you gotta marry somebody <laughs> <laughs> but the prince is just going along with whatever it's fine Malin went to the room to give this girl her meals the bride but the bride she okay this is not nice but okay i get about the ugliness the bride they said the bride knew she was ugly she was like, you know, no, she's I like, mean... I'm not a looker and I'm a bitch. <laughs> she's like, I don't know if this is going to go well, but I need to marry this man. So she's like, look, mainly here's the situation. I don't want to go out there because if this dude sees me, it's going to be hell. So I'm going to have you put my bride clothes on. and You're going to go out there. And she's like, I'd rather not. <laughs> she's like, on account of that's my ex and I'm nervous. He's the one who got away or the one that was pushed away because I was in a tower. And mm -hmm. she doesn't know that. Though. The bride doesn't know that. This is what Malin's, Malin's thinking in her head. And she was like, listen, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. And she's like, oh, in that case, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> Malin's like, I'm it's a very it. convincing argument. <laughs> she's like, I'm not going to die over this. <laughs> he puts on the, the bride outfit. She gets ready. She puts on the veil. And she's out here, right? She's going and she's probably sweating bullets. If I was her, I'd be like, oh, she probably sees her. The guy she used to like, me. okay, right. everybody, you've all seen, you've all known this moment. Maybe not all of you, maybe just me. But like, <laughs> you, see, you see somebody maybe you used to like, and you're like, oh, they look good. And you're mad. <laughs> and you have to remind yourself how toxic they were. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You see a picture and you're like, ah, oh, he looks good as hell. But you have to remind, oh, but he's a crazy person. Yeah, yeah. but they open their mouth sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> you have to remember all the reasons that you yeah. got away from that person. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they have a six pack now. You have to pull yourself <laughs> away. Anyway, so Melina seeing the prince, he probably looks great probably in a gray outfit it's his wedding day he probably looks sharp right so she's like okay here we go now oh another thing you guys should know when Maline and her girlfriend were walking around they were eating nettles like because they had nothing to eat they were hungry right 
they were they had nothing, so they were eating nettles and plants and stuff. So they're walking out into the church, like, and I guess it's a long walk because a lot happens. You'll see. So they're walking, and Malene says she sees a little nettle plant, and she sees it. <laughs> It's actually on her back. <laughs> she was like, oh my God, I don't know what. So she says that. She says, oh, nettle plant, little nettle plant. What thou, what thou, thou here alone? I have known the time when I ate thy unboiled, when I ate thy unroasted. And the king's son said, what? <laughs> oh, oh, no, nothing. I, I didn't say anything. I was thinking of made Malene. And he said, what? You were thinking of who? And she said, Maybelline. He's like, how do you know Maybelline? She's like, actually, I don't know her. I just heard like a story about her one time. And he's like, okay, fine. That's weird. So then they keep walking and she, they come to a footbridge. And she says, footbridge do not break. I am not the true bride. She's like saying this under her <laughs> She's I'm like, Malene, shut up. <laughs> like, you can't talk about all this stuff. So she said, um, Footbridge, do not break. I'm not the true bride. And he's like, what's that? And she's like, oh, nothing. I was thinking, once again, I was just thinking about Mae Malene. And he's like, wow, you really, you really like to think about Mae Malene, don't you? And she's You're like, obsessed with her. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you give out my ex all the time? Okay, fine. So then... They come to the church door, and then once again, she opens her mouth, and she's like, church door, break not. I'm not the true bride. And he said, what did you say? <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah. So I was thinking about me and Malene again. And he's like, what are you talking about? So he's just like, whatever. Let's just get this. He At this point, remember, the prince still thinks he's marrying some girl he doesn't know. So he's like, mm -hmm. let's just get this over with. So he gets a pretty necklace and he puts it around her neck and he's like oh. they go to the priest the priest says whatever he's got to say they get married cool then he walks her home now the veil is still on and she didn't talk at the end because she was like i'm really talking too much so they get back to the royal palace she runs into the bridal chamber like i should change so she runs in there and meets the real bride in there the ugly girl and she she takes off her clothes puts back on her mate's outfit and gives all the clothes back to the real bride. Now, it's the only thing she keeps on is her necklace that he gave her. So when that night came, the bride, the real bride, she was led into the prince's room because they got to do the boom now to consummate. So now she, she let the veil come off her face. This is not nice. Hold on. So they said that they let the veil come off her face and he jumped back. He said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Said, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> and this is what she didn't want to have happen in yes. front of everyone at the church. <laughs> okay. So now he's not trying to be rude. <laughs> but now he's just like, okay, yes, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> he's uncomfortable, bedtime. <laughs> I feel like the prince really didn't want to be rude. I think he didn't know. I'm not going to get too mad at him. But he was shocked. Let's just say that. Now, so he jumps back and he's like, okay. So then they start talking and he's like, by the way, what was that thing that you said about to the nettle plant when we were walking? And she's mm -hmm. like, what? And he's like, you said something to the nettle plant. What was that about? And she's like, I don't talk to nettle plants. And he said, if you don't talk to nettle plants, you obviously aren't the one who married me. Ooh. And she's like, oh, hold up. Hold I have to pee. <laughs> he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he, she runs. Down the hall. And she's like, Maybelline, get your ass over here. What were you talking to Nettle Plant? What did you say? So she tells her, she's like, I said this thing. Oh, Nettle Plant, little Nettle Plant, blah, blah, blah. So the bride runs back to the room and she's like, oh, sorry, I'm done peeing now. Um, Actually, what I had said was, oh, Nettle Plant, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, oh, okay, cool. And then he's like, oh, yeah. And then what about the footbridge? You said something else about the footbridge. What was that about? And she's like, what do you mean, Footbridge? It's like, well, we're walking past the Footbridge. You said something. Why'd you say that? And she's like, I don't talk to Footbridges. He's like, then, girl, you are the one I married. Like, this is what I'm trying to tell you. And she's like, oh, now I have to defecate. <laughs> she's like, what? She's like, I got poop. Romantic. <laughs> I know. 
And he's like, okay, you didn't have to tell me, but go ahead, girl. Like, like <laughs> <that's> like- <laughs> she runs. She's got to go. And she's like, Maymeline, come here. So she comes and she's like, what did you say at the footbridge? And she's like, oh, I said that the footbridge shouldn't break because if it broke, it meant I was the bride. And she's like, first of all, why the hell would you say something like that? <laughs> like, she said, when I get done with this night, your head is going to roll, okay? That's it. That's all you need to know. So Maybelline was like, oh, I done fucked up, but whatever. <laughs> she's like, what you going to do now? So she goes back to her husband. She's like, sorry about that. I'm trying to be a delicate little flower, but I had to poop. So I'm okay now. Don't worry. And he's, she tells him, okay, I said footbridge do not break. I'm not your true bride. He's like, oh, okay. Okay, cool. And then he's like, the last thing, though, you said, what was that about? She said, what did I say now? <laughs> he said, you know, about the church door. And she's like, I didn't say anything to the church door. And he's like, yes, you did. And if you didn't, you're not my bride. And she's like, oh, my God. Okay. I think I left my uh, hairpin in the bathroom. He's like, okay. <laughs> she goes, Maybelline, what the, right? And she's like, okay, this is what I said about the church door. And she's like, for real, I'm having you executed when I'm done. Because this is actually, your the whole night is ruined. Because I had to run back and forth trying to figure out all these things that you said to my husband. So she gets back to the room. She's now probably trying to be like sexy, right? She's got her Savage by Fenty on. And she's like, okay, it's time. <laughs> He's like. Oh, she probably not getting a little undressed. Yeah. He said, like, where's the necklace I got you? And she goes, what necklace? He's like, you, I gave you a necklace today. You're not wearing it. Where is that? She's like, I don't think you gave me a necklace. She's like, I did give you a necklace. And then he looks at her and he's like, I don't even think you're the one that I married. And she's like, Bro, what are you talking about? He's like, I swear to God, you're not the one I married. You don't look like. He's like, the one that I married looked like my the girl that I used to be in love with, Malie. You don't even look anything like Malie. And she kept talking about Malie. And I knew it was Malie. Go get that girl. He's like, if you don't, I'm, I'm going to lose my mind. So she's like, fine. So she goes and gets the girl, brings her back. And she tells him, like, look, I did this only because I was afraid. You jumped back when you saw me. Like, I was afraid of that. And he's like, I don't care. So then he brings in Malene. And he's like, oh, my God, Malene. <laughs> he's so excited. He's like, the love of my life is here. Oh, my God. So he's losing his shit. He's so excited. He can't believe Malene is here. And then the woman, though, in the meantime, had already gone, in, the ugly one, she already gone and told the guards to come get Malene and execute her. So they grab Malene, run out. The king's son's trying to run. They're holding him back. She's like, kill her. So they get in the courtyard and they're literally about to cut Malene's head off. The king runs out. The king calls off the guards from her son. They all come through. They're like, no, don't kill Malene. Malene gets up. Her son is like, oh my God, I thought you were dead. Like, that's the only reason I stopped going to the tower. I just assumed after seven years, you were dead. And she's like, nah, I was just up there suffering, man. This it was rough. <laughs> and she's like, He's like, since I put the necklace on you, we did all of our vows. We're basically married now. And she's yeah. like, that like that sounds good to me. Yeah. So, so then they end up being married. Homegirl who was unattractive ended up being executed, and everybody was fine. They all lived their lives except the ugly girl who got killed. Sorry. And now there's a tower that was there for a long time where Malin was, and apparently. When the kids walked by it, they used to say, Clang Gloria, who sits within this tower? A king's daughter, she sits within. A sight of her I cannot win. The wall, it will not break. The stone cannot be pierced. Little Hans, with your coat so gay, follow me fast as you may. I don't know why Hans had to be involved in this or who that is, but that's fine. <laughs> he has a nice coat <laughs> and then wanted to talk about it. So, that's the story of being Malene. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> Besides the maiden in the tower, was there other reasons that you really wanted to bring that one up? No, I just always I just laughed when they were like, oh, he jumped back because she was so ugly. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that is so rude. <laughs> I said, how 
dare he? He was. A... <laughs> <laughs> it's just I really, <laughs> I really did want to see that. Like, I, I was hoping that was going to happen at the wedding ceremony, though. Before, before we found out about the false bride in detail. <laughs> Everyone's just like, oh, girl. <laughs> Isn't that what they said? Henry the Eighth. <laughs> I guess it's not, but didn't Henry the Eighth see Anna Cleves coming down the river? And he says, send her back. <laughs> he said, absolutely not. I can't marry that one. <laughs> but then they like became friends. <laughs> You know what I also liked was when Maline and her lady in waiting got to that kingdom, they turned to Maline and said, You look like a good lady in waiting. <laughs> Meanwhile, the lady in waiting is like, I, like, that's actually what I am. <laughs> They're like, You're a scullery maid. <laughs> She's like, I've literally been in the tower with this princess for seven years playing my child. I know how to do it. <laughs> I'm really good. <laughs> I helped her escape from a tower. I'm very good at my job. <laughs> yeah, she's really good at her job. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, that was funny. Oh. So that brings us now to the end of our episode. Erin, this has been a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we got to talk. Likewise. It was very generous of you to, to invite me onto the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, no. Oh, I enjoy it. And I was like, oh, our podcast is great. We make a line there. Your podcast is very cute. I really love it. It's, Thank you. I like it. Yeah. So now I always tell everybody, tell people where they can find you on the internet and if they want to listen to you more, what they should do. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Spotify. I am Freighter Aaron on Facebook and pretty much everywhere else. You can find me at Storybook Podcast or Storybook Witchcraft. Again, the uh, the podcast is a, is a series of discussions called Storybook Sacred Lore of Witchcraft, where we look at fairy tales. I'll usually have an episode where I narrate the fairy tale, and then the follow-up episode will be a more in-depth panel dis- discussion where we take apart some of the details and talk about how that influences our craft. I'll be at Mystic South this year, July 25th through, or J- July 26th through 28th and discussing ecstatic practices that are hidden in Grimm's fairy tales. Ooh, that sounds interesting. I love that. What a perfect, oh, I'm so glad. What a perfect episode. And then you're talking about, oh, this is great. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I don't, like, I, okay. People who listen to this podcast, I literally don't, like, sometimes know what I'm going to talk about. You, obviously, you have a podcast mm-hmm. about story. So I was like, what better to talk about than Grimm's Fairy Tales? That I didn't plan that. Like, it was, I'm just so happy. And, and it just, I said, spirit, you guys are always working for me. And I love it. Thank you. So, yay. Okay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put a link to Aaron's podcast. I'm going to put a link to Mystic South. So everybody can check it out when you want to. And if you want to and all this stuff. Yay. It's great. So. Thank you so much once again, Erin, for being here. This is great. And everybody, if you don't know, now you're listening to Die with the Divine. This is the podcast that I talk all the time and we have guests and it's a good time. You can find me on Instagram, on threads. I sometimes I'm there and sometimes I forget about it. You can find me on Facebook. And if you want to follow, oh, and YouTube. And if you want to follow me, Ashley, I'm Sankofa Healing Sanctuary on Facebook, Instagram, threads that's usually about it so anyway rate and review the podcast if you haven't already i'd really appreciate it and i appreciate all of you for listening and i'll talk to all of you next week bye bye bye